proof um, with an indirect proof built into first order predicate logic and I, and I walk through the proof. The assumptions that I made in that in first order predicate logic two being were um, assumed to be true and proven to be true based on the structure of the, the formal process of deduction. If, however, at some point later I recognized that those assumptions were incorrect or those assumptions were, the, the truth of those assumptions were uncertain or varied or not as factually true as what I assumed at the initial point, everything collapses. What non-monotonic logic does, and we're definitely not going to get to this level of complexity because that requires a lot. I mean, you really have to know your first order predicate logic. You should be able to do, like if you can do conditional proof with implication in, we'd be able to have that discussion. But at this point in my YouTube series, I'm not that comfortable. I didn't think I'd be comfortable doing non-monotonic logic, and here I am doing it. So maybe at some point in the future, I might really, really get technical. But I want to, you know, bring everybody up gradually. Uh, and then maybe at some point in the future, we'll be able to do it. So um, it's hard to describe um, the idea of how assumptions play into first order predicate logic and why it's the case that um, this is not an easy lecture to have at all. Why it's the case that, wait, let me, let me say it so that it makes sense. Um, you make an assumption, you make an assumption that your wife will be happy if you buy her flowers on her birthday. You make the assumption. So you go out and you buy flowers for her on her birthday. And she comes in from work or whatever, and you surprise her, hey, sweetie, here are the flowers for your birthday. Uh, and after you give her the flowers, you recognize that based on her body language and her feedback, and eventually from the full-blown argument that you have, worst case scenario, that she was like, I mean, that's all you got me? You stopped on the side of the road and you got me some five dollar flowers? I mean, I, thanks, but I thought we would do something else. Your assumption that getting flowers for your wife on her birthday would make her happy as a conclusion is falsified by the fact that she's not happy. So you thought that giving her flowers would make her happy as a conclusion, as a consequence of your act, only to find out that the consequence didn't manifest, right? The consequence didn't manifest, she was actually upset. Well, because she was upset, because the consequence that you expected didn't manifest, then you recognize that your assumptions were wrong. So technically speaking, you're not able to recognize that your assumptions are wrong until you are able to assess the consistency of the consequences, to be technical. But I th hopefully that, I don't know how to draw that, <laughs> but hopefully that makes sense, that, that sort of general example makes sense. That's what we're doing. We're, we're able to recognize and falsify, to be technical, we're, we're able to render defeasible prior assumptions that we once assumed to be true. I'm using technical language now, right? We're able to render defeasible prior assumptions that we once thought to be true based on um, an unexpected consequence. Because the consequence isn't what we wanted it to be, then we can transform the nature of our assumptions so that I'm not going to make the same assumptions next time. I'll do something different. And that's how we progress, right? All right, so that's the first part. Um, for example, consider the following statement. And here's a, here's a, super, here's a super simple uh, example. So the following statement is this. Um, the original reasoning process. Mary is a loving mother who never harms her child, or never harms her children. So, before we actually get into the formal, again, I'm just giving example after example after example, real sort of general, so that you have, you know, multiple ideas to pull from, so that you see the, the very general structure of what we're doing here. Imagine you have this, this, uh, this conception. Mary is a loving mother who would never harm her child, her, her, harm her children, right? We recognize that this statement has truth functionality. It is the case that that's true, or it is not the case that that's true, right? Well, remember, what we're doing is we're looking at, if you want to think of it conceptually, we're looking at the statement not at one instance in time, but we're looking at this statement which has truth functionality throughout time. So we're introducing a sort of a conception of continuity of the statement, right? 
not is the statement true at time t1, but is the statement true, or what is the nature of the truth of the statement throughout time, t1, t2, t3, t4, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And what you'll see is that there's varying degrees of truth. It was more true at one time, it's less true at another. New information transformed the nature of that truth, and so on. So uh, the, next, the next point, the new information is added. And what's the new information that we received? I recently discovered that Mary was diagnosed with Munchausen by proxy, which is a disorder where you harm your children. So you think to yourself, well, if it's the case that I once made the statement, I once had the belief that Mary is a loving mother who would never harm her child, only to find out later that she has this diagnosis, well, I'm going to, ch I'm going to change the nature of my assumptions. It can't be the case that um, she loves her child, assuming that this is true, because she's physically hurting her child. Right? She might not be aware of it and whatever, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, I have transformed the nature of my assumption. My assumption has changed. I once made the statement and I held to be true that Mary is someone who loves her children. And then I then transformed that to, well, and then I got new information and found out that Mary was diagnosed with this horrible disorder. And then I transformed my assumption, right? And what is, what is the case? The synthesis is, the idea that Mary would never harm her children is defeated, right, defeasibility. The idea that she would never harm her children is defeated behind her diagnosis. Thus, part of our initial, uh, original reasoning has been defeated, right? Our, our reasoning is, has been defeated. How so? Uh, the idea that Mary would never harm her children has been rendered false by her diagnosis, right? This obviously assumes uh, an accuracy in her diagnosis. So I'm going to stop there and then I'm going to continue uh, the last page of section four in a bit because I'm approaching, um, I'm approaching uh, my battery life. Um, so just real quick so that we have an understanding of what we've covered to this point. The advantage of non-monotonic logic over first order predicate logic is the idea that we can construct a formal language that addresses uncertainty. Insofar as we can construct the formal language that addresses uncertainty, the advantage that we gain is a flexibility in our critical thinking, in our reasoning, such that we can recognize that the world isn't just black or white, true or false, that there are varying degrees of truth or falsity with respect to any statements or propositions that might be made. And insofar as we look at that proposition, that statement, throughout a continuum, and not rather at an instance, we can make a better... Um, more articulated uh, representation of the actual nature of the statement, right? It isn't the case that it's just false that Mary loves her children. She's sure, I'm sure she loves her children. But to say that she loves her children de facto without incorporating that new bit of information, her diagnosis, is to misrepresent the true nature of the, and this is what's important, right? It's to misrepresent the true nature of the relationship between Mary and her children. And the, uh, the, the, common, the common assumption is that it's more complicated than that, right? The idea that it's more complicated than that means that we need to have more information in order, um, in order and before we can make our assessments of, of the truth. So at that point, um, I'm going to stop. And then when we continue, we'll go into um, more formal language of non-monotonic logic and reasoning, and we'll see how... Um, a new modal operator will be involved uh, in what is going to be our, our, our burgeoning sort of mathematical syntax, right? We'll m be able to arrive and to do new, um, new assessments of statements. We'll be able to make sense of relational, um, relational accounts better uh, with, this new, with this new syntax. And what I'm going to do is I'm also going to incorporate it and tie it to other concepts that we've already discussed, serial argumentation, um, hypothetical syllogism, and so on. So I'll continue in, uh, in just a second.